I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. And we are two Shakespeare nerds who decided to make a podcast about our love for Shakespeare. In this podcast, we will tackle as many dimensions to Shakespeare's plays as we can by looking at the text, examining the historical context in which it was written, and how the text is viewed through modern lenses of feminism, racism, classism, colonialism, nationalism, ableism, all of the isms. We will discuss how his plays shaped both the past and present, and, as actors, how his plays can be responsibly performed today, all while trying our best to approach his works without giving in to bardolatry. So, Shakespeare anyone? Hi listeners, it's Courtney here. If you are listening to this episode after 2023, you might be wondering, who is this Corey Lee Smith host? When we started this podcast, I went by that stage name, Corey. I've chosen to leave my stage name and, as you know, I now go by Courtney. But before you enjoy past Elise and past Courtney's episodes in our back catalog, I wanted to clarify the name switch. Now that I've set that straight, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Hello listeners, this is Courtney. Elise and I are so thrilled to continue bringing episodes of Shakespeare Anyone to listeners like you for free. We do this out of our love for Shakespeare, theater making, scholarship, and decentering dead white men. We put a lot of hard work into research, recording, editing, and generally producing a podcast. With that said, I'm here to remind you all that we have a Patreon page if you want to support our current work and our future goals that we believe Patreon will help us achieve. We've created a variety of support levels and continue to create exclusive bonus content for our patrons on a monthly basis. Our bonus content so far includes Shakespeare Stuff We Loved This Month posts, where we share the Shakespeare-related products we are obsessing over. Not only that, but we already launched bonus episodes. One is an extension on our conversation with Dr. Simone Chess about John Lilly's Galatea and Early Modern Trans Studies. And the second is a conversation with special guest Stephanie from Protest Too Much Podcast, in which we review Joel Cohen's Macbeth starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. Elise and I also discuss Shakespeare-adjacent content, like movies, TV shows, books, to name a few, and share those conversations exclusively to Patreon. These are incredible conversations you can unlock as a patron. We also have plans for additional bonus episodes, including more special guests, more film reviews, and even an Ask Us Anything. Distinguished patrons even receive exclusive voting power and snail mail. If you would like to join us and support the production of this podcast, or just check out the Shakespeare-themed names we've given the support levels, head to patreon.com slash shakespeareanyone. The link will also be in our episode descriptions. And if you like what you hear, Elise and I would greatly appreciate it if you could rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Your review might even make it on an episode. When you're done, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and then tell a friend. Word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Thank you for listening and all of the support you give us and the podcast. Now, onto the episode. Hi, Elise. Okay. Hi, Corey. Oh, whoops. I had a ding. <laughs> <laughs> we are professional, but sometimes we have problems. <laughs> yeah, sometimes <laughs> we struggle. Mm hmm. How are you doing, Elise? I I'm doing okay. Mm hmm. How are you doing? Same. It's a little hot in my booth, my closet booth, but I'm excited to talk about something ooky spooky for our Hamlet series. Yeah, something very, very uh, fall vibes today. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we talking about? We are talking about death and the afterlife. So ghosts. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about ghosts in our Macbeth series with mm -hmm. demonology and kind of at the time of writing Macbeth, what was the like Protestant belief in ghosts and that they were the 
devil and or sent from the devil. They are tricks. Mm -hmm. They are not real things. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to go a little bit more in depth and see well, what else is going on, because we know that that's not the only point of view that exists during this time. Right. And as we were looking at the ghost of Banquo, it was like that ghost is so different from old Hamlet. So right. clearly these come from different ghost traditions or ghost lore because the yeah. ghost of Banquo does not speak. Old Hamlet Speaks. has a lot to say mm -hmm. and sends Hamlet on a quest for revenge. So, right. Yeah. What is what's going on there? Uh, so I have a little bit of background on kind of the early modern Protestant theological belief in ghosts mm. and the path that that had gone on, um, just to start us off and ground us in the religious beliefs of the time regarding ghosts. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get into where are these other sources then. Starting off, going way back, the early Christian church actually did not believe in ghosts. And they came up with this belief as a way to really separate themselves from pagan Romans. This is like the time mm. of St. Augustine. He said that funerals were primarily for the comfort of the survivors and that once someone was dead, God was done with them. And that position actually lasted for several centuries, but the Romans had ghost folklore and that ghost folklore still never goes away. No. Then that official position changed in the 12th century when the Catholic Church made ghosts kind of newly official and mm. invented purgatory. So ghosts could now kind of serve the institution of the church because there were now masses that set the spirits to rest and helping them move through purgatory um, and right the wrongs that were done in their life so that they could ascend to heaven. Uh huh. Then really oversimplifying, going really fast, we get Protestants. And in the Reformation, they abolish the concept of purgatory because they see it as very much a you know, money scheme for the church of like, well, if you're charging people to help their loved ones move through purgatory, like also they have right. a huge issue with the actual geography of purgatory, that purgatory isn't something that's mentioned in the Bible at all. Like, where is it? Like, they know that there is a heaven and that Jesus goes to hell. Therefore, those must be places. And the early medieval church even had like very specific places for these uh -huh. realms right in my reading i read was it right next to hell was it above hell was it near heaven yeah like, that was a contested issue is it under the earth is it above the earth mm -hmm. is it an actual physical place on earth for both heaven hell and purgatory so like where do these places exist and basically the Protestants went the bible doesn't say anything about purgatory so it's made up by the catholic church and we're doing away with it yeah. However, this still has little effect on the popular belief in ghosts. People still believe in ghosts. And eventually, even the Protestants make room for the existence of ghosts and these people's experience and belief in ghosts by saying what we talked about in demonology, that ghosts are sent by the devil to trick good people into doing bad things. Right. Yeah. Because in demonology, I, I looked at my notes with spirits to see and I was like oh no I'm revisiting this again but <laughs> the corpse the corpse of the faithless and a faithful person can be used by the devil so it has everything mm -hmm. to do with being used so when a person yeah. is dead their soul cannot be corrupted but their body is a vessel for the devil yeah and so scholars argued that seen in the long context of all of this that that argument of like a person's body is being inhabited by the devil it's not their soul but like mm -hmm. you're seeing this revenant walk around okay sure it's the devil is what the protestants yeah. are saying because people are going but i saw yeah i, I saw, saw so a ghost so i saw old so-and-so's ghost and yeah so the protestants are saying okay sure you did so it was this instead it wasn't it, it wasn't them yeah and they called it wraiths i think it, yeah it's just a type it's like a type of ghost but that's like the protestant demonology definition of what that ghost is yeah so, yeah, basically from like a theological perspective at Shakespeare's time, if you're, you know, a good Protestant person, ghosts shouldn't exist. Mm. Mm -hmm. But we see them in plays like Macbeth, like Hamlet. So what other sources are out there for the ghost lore, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, in their article, Shakespeare's Sad Tale for Winter, Hamlet and the Tradition of Fireside Ghost Stories, 
Catherine Beasley makes the argument that Hamlet is more informed by popular ghost stories than by Christian theology. Mm. So ghost stories, or as Shakespeare's people in Shakespeare's time have called them, winter's tales, old wives' tales, they're a very popular storytelling oral tradition uh, that are popular in winter as a way for people to pass the time because the sun sets early, it gets cold, you sit around a fire, and you tell stories. Right. Lady Macbeth. Yes. During the Banquo scene calls it a woman story at a winter's fire, authorized by her granddam. Yes. So these like passed down stories that are told often by women around fires. That's exactly right. <laughs> um, my reading also referenced that. Lady M. Mm -hmm. So there are indications that early audiences saw Hamlet as a ghost story. Hmm. When we talk about the ghost in Hamlet, all three early published texts of Hamlet are relatively consistent in their depiction of the ghost. In fact, according to the oldest production records we have, quote, Thomas Betterton, who played Hamlet in 1661, was able to make the ghost equally terrible to the spectator as to himself. Although we can be certain of almost nothing about the staging of the play in Shakespeare's lifetime, there is some evidence for a degree of continuity between Burbage's Hamlet and Betterton's, unquote. So early productions likely saw this ghost as very scary. Uh-huh. Cool. And in fact, other ghost stories of the time match the depiction of old Hamlet. So a lot of times historians and scholars will point to the plays of Seneca and the plays of Plutarch as a point from which the ghost is inspired. Mm-hmm. But those ghosts aren't always avenging specters. Sometimes they come forward and they deliver a prologue about some wrong that has happened. And then they step aside for the rest of the play. They don't interfere with like the right. action of the play. They're not as integral in pushing the plot forward. Right. Versus old Hamlet. If he does not show up, there is no revenge. Hamlet is just sad. Mm-hmm. They probably contribute something. Like There's probably some inspiration there. But they... But not to the degree. One thing that we have in Hamlet that is not in Plutarch or Seneca is this like buildup of dramatic tension before the arrival of the ghost and before we even hear the ghost speak. Right. We hear about the ghost and we we're told about the ghost and then the ghost enters and it's scary and it's weird and it's unnatural. Yeah. And Senecan ghosts are recognizable as who they were a little bit more like Banquo, whereas old Hamlet isn't instantly recognizable. Right. One thing that I read was that the Senecan ghosts and specters return from like a classical underworld. And mm -hmm. there's also Virgil is also uh, an inspiration from the classical texts and like his Aeneid and Virgil's ghosts are like disembodied shades. And so there's like less terror to them. But the ghosts from the uh, medieval ghost folklore they're like returning from the grave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's one is far more terrifying. Yeah. With these ghosts, in fact, outside of Shakespeare and even prior to Julius Caesar in 1599, stage ghosts aren't uncanny. They're not mysterious. You don't have anyone asking, what art thou? It's like, oh, look, it is someone returned from the underworld. Catherine Belsley says, quote, there's no incentive to ask Horatio's question, what art thou, with these other ghosts. And uh, even when we compare one of Shakespeare's other ghosts with Julius Caesar and Brutus to Sir Thomas North's translation of the Julius Caesar story, it's not eerie either. Quote, the fear and the question are divided in Plutarch. Only when his terror subsides is Brutus free to ask the spirit's identity. Shakespeare, by contrast, brings them together so that the fear is brought into being by the unknown. Is this figure real or illusion, divine or demonic? what is it, unquote. So other translations of like a Plutarch ghost will separate fear. They might have fear, they might have that apprehension, but it subsides and then someone can interact with the ghost. Whereas with Shakespeare, it's all in one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hamlet is like already engaged with the ghost and he's like, are you good? Are you bad? Are you going to help? Are you going to damn me to hell? Are you like a trick of the devil? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we do have some few surviving popular tales from vernacular ghost lore that 
do not seem to overlap with scraps of church teaching. Mm. And we have some access to material that retains vernacular elements to demonstrate that these stories survived into Shakespeare's time and beyond. So one of these stories is the legend of the three living and the three dead. These mm-hmm. were here nodding. Yeah, I also, read about. Did you also come across this? I came story across that story as well. Yeah. Okay. Did you read what the story is about? No, what I it? read okay. about how it was depicted in terms of like the visual elements. So tell me, what is the story? Oh, okay. Because I have a little bit about that and you can probably tell me more. Mm-hmm. So this story has three richly dressed kings going out hunting and being very carefree um, and wealthy. And they are confronted by three corpses that are like dead. Three corpses that are dead. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> three corpses that are decaying. They're gross. And the dead say to the living, quote, as we are, so you shall be, unquote. And depictions of these revenants, these corpses that are like bony figures naked but for like their shroud some tatters yeah, of tattered the shrouds. clothes worms devour them that worms kind of devouring them grotesque imagery yeah so even now there are paintings of this on the walls mm-hmm. of more than a dozen english parish churches as well mm-hmm. as one domestic property that somehow survived the whitewashing of the the reformation the, the reformation and yeah. the puritans yeah mm-hmm yeah, in at least two of the paintings, um, they are copied from a rendering in the Arundel Psalter of Robert the Liesel or a shared original. So a couple of them match this book. And mm-hmm. that manuscript is in really excellent condition and it gives us an idea of how common people interpreted this legend. In this depiction of them above the living kings are three utterances, which... Here I go, reading some truly, like, older Middle English. Okay. <laughs> ich am a fiert, lo what ich say. Me think th- hit the th- devils there. And then the three dead reply, ich was well fair, such shall to be, for God's love beware by me. Which is, like, basically, the first living king is like, I'm scared. <laughs> and then um, his companion is like, oh, what do I see? Um, And the third one is like, I think that there are devils here. And the dead again declare that they were just like them and they were just like these kings. The kings will be just like them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds quite Hamlet as he's pondering like how great, great figures in history end up being like pieces to like stop a barrel or whatever. Right. And Hamlet even calls old hamlet the ghost a dead corpse that has burst its cerements cast up by the sepulcher to revisit the night so he mm. calls it a revenant some one of these like corpses that are like walking dead instead of like a victorian specter casper mm-hmm. sort of situation mm-hmm. some like jacob marley stuff yeah or more um you know in lord of the rings the like dead kings yeah like that <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 yeah the army of ghost kings right and most of these wall paintings date from the 14th century and we have an alliterative poem that was assembled after 1426 that shows that the story continued into the 15th century yeah that story uh was really popular and there were transi tombs which are these like life-size stone tombs that would have an emaciated corpse and Mm -hmm. the three living and the three dead wall paintings was a very popular one on those transi tombs and that was 15th century moving forward Ooh, okay. Also, in that poem I mentioned earlier that comes out sometime after 1426, I'm going to call it the Shropshire Poem. Um, Mm -hmm. It's by author John Audley, and it develops the myth of these three kings even further. And it makes the three dead the fathers of the living kings, and also they're like doubles. So they Mm. say things like, make your mirror be me, much like uh, how Hamlet is encountering his father, a dead king, right? And then there's a parallel poem that is written about the same time in Northwest England, where the ghost of Guinevere's mother appears at the hunt to warn the young queen against excess. Quote, like the three dead, this revenant, bare, pale, hollow-eyed, muddy, consumed by toads and snakes, urges her daughter to see her own future in this glass. Unquote. 
And this is reflected when Hamlet urges York to act as a mirror and says, quote, now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick to this favor she must come, unquote. This could be the story of Guinevere's mother appearing to her and telling her not to engage in excess. Uh huh. So that quote to Yorick is possibly a reference to this story that was well about before. About Guinevere's mother, the ghost of Guinevere's mother telling her, be wary of excess and overdoing things. So uh-huh. some of what Hamlet says to Gertrude or says about Gertrude might be in reference to this story this- of Guinevere's mother. Yeah, so Guinevere then saw her mother just like Hamlet and Old Mm -hmm. Hamlet. Mm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Belsey argues that when we first see Hamlet, his melancholy centers on his mother's frailty and the corresponding forgetfulness of the living. But after he meets the ghost, his situation changes and he's more focused on death itself and the possibility of his own death Mm. as well as the like need for revenge because regicides don't generally live to enjoy their triumph. The ghost of his father is essentially asking him to end his own life by seeking revenge. Yeah. There's a couple other ghost stories. So about 100 miles away, there is this monk in Byland Abbey who starts jotting down the history of Snowball the Tailor. Mm. This Byland Abbey monk writes a, quite a few ghost stories onto this manuscript. This manuscript. But Snowball's a big one. Snowball was apparently writing home one night when he encountered a shape-shifting figure that knocked him violently to the ground, and Snowball fought it off with his sword, and then, summoning his faith, conjured the apparition, basically addressed it in the name of the Trinity and with the blood of Christ, um, and told it to stand still and reveal its name, and it went away. Then Snowball encounters it again, and the spirit assumes the shape of a goat, but again, when, like, (laughs) addressed... It fell to the earth and, quote, rose up in the shape of a large man, horrible and emaciated in the likeness of one of the dead painted kings. Mm. So basically what this tells us is, like, the story of the Three Kings was pretty widespread that, like, this monk a hundred miles away would reference it in a ghost story that he's telling as, like, a cultural, like, oh, you know, like those dead kings. Yeah. And all of these tales are like winter's tales. They have elements of pagan legends, a few fragments of orthodox theology. There's like one that depicts the spirits howling. There are incidents that take place at crossways. We know from Midsummer Night's Dream are likely places for the graves of those that are denied Christian burial. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's another ghost story that has no church doctrine at all in it. And it's the story of James Tankerley. Uh, So James Tankerley, the spirit of James Tankerley is corporeal and dangerous much like the spirit that assaulted snowball and in the story his body has to be disposed of because he's doing things like blowing out the eyes of people and oxen almost get drowned when they're trying to like rectify how he's buried and like get him to disappear like his ghost is committing violence yeah yeah he's a threat to the people to the living yeah so like they have to dispose of the body in a different way And there's another story that that comes from two miles from Byland where there's animated cadavers. Mm -hmm. The walking corpse has to be like dug up and cremated. And in this story, like the bishop intercedes and he places like a scroll conferring absolution in the coffin on the corpse's chest. These stories start to have the bit of like revenant. The specter needs to be put at peace. Otherwise, they're going to like continue to do violence. Right. And that's interesting because we don't have old Hamlet performing acts or threatening to be violent. Mm-hmm. But, but he's he, inciting. But he's, in, yeah, he's inciting someone be violent towards another person. And it's not like, put my soul to rest, you know. It's yeah. like, you need to right this wrong. Right. I just think it's interesting that he hasn't, like, harmed Horatio or the guards or Hamlet or gone and done anything himself. He needs mm-hmm. Hamlet to do it for him for the revenge tragedy. Yeah. There's one that is also like shape-shifting and corporeal and it appears to a disinterested party and in fact has a very similar situation to hamlet it's uh, the story of james haddock's ghost Mm. it seems to come from bylan tales it's close enough and it's like almost this bridge between them and hamlet Mm -hmm. so the story goes that francis taverner was riding home to hillbro in ireland one night in 1662 and his horse came to a sudden stop at the crossroads And he saw three horsemen who rode by without a sound. And then the third rider was in a white coat and claimed to be James Haddock, 
who was kind of known to Taverner, but had been dead for five years. Mm. And this figure went on to hunt Taverner repeatedly, quote, instructing him to intervene with Haddock's widow, now remarried to a man who had appropriated property bequeathed to Haddock to his own son. In the end, the ghost threatened to tear Taverner to pieces if he failed to deliver the message. And then, changing itself into many prodigious shapes, it vanished. Only when he obeyed did the ghost finally depart, crawling on its hands and feet over the courtyard wall while the property was restored to the boy, unquote. Ooh. So much like Hamlet, we have a ghost story where a ghost appears to a third party who's not really involved in the drama mm-hmm. and then is like, you need to do this thing, otherwise I'll continue to haunt you. Right. And specifically, we have a dead father that's returning to point out an injury done to his son's inheritance Mm -hmm. by a man who married the ghost's former wife. Another aspect that we have in these Byland ghost stories, real quick, Mm -hmm. is that they, the Walking Dead, carry infection. One, I mean, dead bodies carry disease. Right. But that these Walking Dead create a pestilence in the air. You know, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Yeah. There's like, and it's this ghost ghost that's actually contaminating Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. this majestical roof fretted with gold fire why it appears to me nothing more than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors like yeah there's a lot of talk about how hamlet is seeing the world hamlet sees denmark as having a contagion and a pestilence right Right. and he's also and it's a ghost yeah and it's is it the ghost that's the contagion is it the remarriage contagion yeah, what's causing it? Is it the ghost? Is it the remarriage, Gertrude remarrying to Claudius? Is it a combination of the both? But mm-hmm. either way. Yeah. Another thing that all these stories and that like ghost stories even today have is a sort of distance between the start of the telling of the story and the action that the story is describing. So it's always, you know, like many years ago, a few mm-hmm. months ago. And it's usually like somebody who, again, is like not fully involved in the ghost story who's like yeah it didn't happen to it's Hamlet. a story authorized by her granddam so my grandmother saw this and she told me and so potentially the uh danish castle of hamlet could give elizabethan playgoers a similar distance and similar suspension of truth for the actions of hamlet so you might be wondering like how does this like affect hamlet's claim that death is the undiscovered country from where no traveler returns, returns yeah and Catherine Belsey argues that old Hamlet doesn't actually return home. He doesn't return to take his place in Elsinore. He is estranged. He haunts the castle walls, appears in Gertrude's closet, but he no longer can come back there as an inhabitant. And therefore that the returning ghost is actually still distinct from the living man. So the living man is the thing that can't return. So Hamlet saying that like no one returns from death is still true because no one returns as they were. No one yeah. returns in a recognizable way in yeah. this play. That makes sense because whatever happens to his spirit, old Hamlet will never walk amongst the living again as a man with like a beating heart and blood. Right, right. Wild. All of this to say, Hamlet was likely seen by early audiences as a ghost story And in Mm -hmm. fact, the play follows the format of a ghost story. Bernardo tells the tale of something that has happened the last two nights, only Mm -hmm. seen by him, to Marcellus and Horatio. And Horatio plays the role of the skeptic, which is a common feature in ghost stories, even till today, that there's somebody who's like, who does not believe. I don't believe you, man, until. Yeah, and has to be convinced. It also allows for a like, all right, well, sit down and let me like retell you everything that has happened in this ghost story. Yeah. Great exposition. There is a section that is typically cut from a lot of productions because for modern readers and audiences, it's like, well, yeah, okay, we've heard this already. It's repetition. But Bernardo urges, quote, sit down a while and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story what we have two nights seen, unquote. And Horatio agrees and the tale begins again. Mm. These three literally sit down and listen to a ghost story on stage. Then And then they become... Then, as Bernardo is weaving the tale, at the very moment where the ghost is to enter Bernardo's narrative, the ghost enters on stage. And Belzy argues that from that point forward, 
we are watching the ghost story unfold instead of listening to it. And the play that we watch is Bernardo's ghost story. I am obsessed with that. Yes. In fact, the play we watch matches Horatio's promised narrative from Act One. It's a story of, quote, carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts, unquote. And the story ends with Hamlet asking Horatio to tell to his tell story. story. To tell his story. I'm in love I'm with that. I'm obsessed with this idea. <laughs> that is, I, I want to see that. I want Hamlet the ghost story because it makes sense. It makes, it makes sense. so much sense. How cool would it be to, again, like have this shift, this thematic shift when the ghost enters into the story of Bernardo and and now Marcellus like Horatio is living the ghost story. Yeah. Yeah. That would be so cool. And I'm imagining too that because old Hamlet is less Senecan or Virgilian or Plutarchan and is more uh, medieval or European pagan ghost folklore, that there's this incredible jump scare when he enters. And it's like an, it's like the early modern The Conjuring or mm-hmm. whatever, you know? Yeah. I have always felt since performing Hamlet that it is more of a thriller. There's this tension throughout. Tons, and yeah. this just was like, yes, it is like a, like you said, The Conjuring. It is a horror than a play about, you know, like the a psychological turmoil drama. of the title character. Yeah. It's much more likely that early audiences were here for a horror movie. Yeah. Here for a play about scary, scary things. And Hamlet does in the play, like, as a as a character in this ghost story. So if we're making Hamlet a character in Bernardo's ghost story, he does consider that this isn't a real ghost. He considers that melancholy is a condition that he's experiencing. And so the devil might be exploiting Hamlet's melancholic condition. But that could merely be a factor in the story versus like the actual style of the story Hamlet as a whole, you know? Yeah. One last thing about the early modern Protestant narrative of this is that the, the people who see the ghost is in contrast with the Protestant ideas of who sees ghosts or Mm -hmm. who sees the devil inhabiting the the body of a person because it would be the guilty who see or the people who may potentially be guilty are the ones who see the spirits. Yeah. Yeah, So why would Horatio, Marcellus, Bernardo, and Hamlet see this old Hamlet, but not Claudius or Claudius? Yeah. Yeah. And comparatively, folklore ghosts appear to disinterested third parties first who would be bernardo yeah they have no skin in the game really bernardo's the perfect person to see this first yeah yeah totally the early modern playgoers likely saw a hero who is much more active than the like ruminating depressed prince of the like 1800s early 1900s and i think today we have seen a sort of return of this kind of active hamlet as we talked about in other episodes, like, is he a clown with antic mm-hmm. disposition? Right. And early modern playgoers likely saw somebody who, you know, was running about the stage, you know, leaping into Ophelia's grave and not somebody who hated life, but was more ruminating on the subject of death as a concept mm. because of mm-hmm. the ghost, not someone who was consumed with his own mortality. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating because that reshapes all of those speeches in terms of like how the actor embodies it and delivers it and how the audience is potentially going to like receive it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So that is all so fascinating to think about this Hamlet as a ghost story. And what I read for this episode is less about the philosophy, the theological doctrine or the pagan influence. And it's, the actual architecture of putting on a play in early modern England that deals with the three tiers, heaven, earth, and hell. Oh, so you're talking about like how this would actually be staged in early right. modern England? Yeah. How Ooh. it may have actually okay. been staged. Okay. Tell the, me. Yeah. So as we're talking about this like active, we've got Hamlet running around probably in, for the early modern audience. How would the ghost have appeared? Mm-hmm. 
I read this article, Then is Doomsday Near, Hamlet, The Last Judgment, and the Place of Purgatory by Kurt A. Schreier. Mm -hmm. And Kurt A. Schreier argues that Shakespeare joined the material features of the early modern playhouse and the restoration of the understage space of purgatory from the medieval doomsday pageant cycles. So the theater that was happening right before the professional playhouses of London uh, were established, um, these pageant cycles and the way that the sets were built and the way that the actors engaged with those sets greatly influenced how an early modern playhouse would have staged a play about ghosts and heaven and hell and possibly purgatory. So we are going to talk a little bit about purgatory. And early modern doctrine of purgatory has its roots in medieval religious liturgy, practice, and art. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's the doomsday pageants of the mystery cycle plays. And that's the like climactic finish of the biblical pageant cycle. And those pageant cycle plays used specific stage traditions and sophisticated pageant wagons designed to accommodate the three levels of heaven, earth, and hell as well as hoisting mechanisms to lower and raise Christ and angels and saved souls. Pageant wagons are one of my favorite topics outside of Shakespeare. (laughs) Tell me more. I will tell you more. So we don't have a whole lot of depictions of pageant wagons. We don't know a whole lot about what they look like. But in Ben Jonson's 1616 works, his complete works that he self-published, it depicts a plowstrum. So there's this, like, woodcut title page and it has a bunch of different elements to his theater experience and in like the bottom right hand corner there's a plowstrum which is a two-wheeled cart that looks like the pageant or movable platform stage of the mysteries and this type of pageant wagon was used for hundreds of years before we even got to the professional playhouses yeah for like quick background people in case people don't know what pageant wagons are right Mm -hmm. before theater was both a place and a thing Mm -hmm. You didn't go to plays, plays came to you. And these medieval pageant plays, what we know about them was that they would be on these carts. They were like Mm -hmm. movable stages. I like to think of it as like a parade float. Yeah. And they would move throughout the town. And so there would be like a scene on one float, one pageant wagon. And then once Mm -hmm. that scene was done, that wagon would move to the next stop. And there'd be another wagon behind it for the next scene. Yeah. And a lot of times for the miracle plays about like the resurrection the different like guilds of the town would participate and Mm -hmm. give their talents and skills to the pageant wagon so the one that i've heard the most is like the butcher's guild would always be helping out with the crucifixion because they have blood on hand from their jobs um so they can make a really gruesome crucifixion scene yes there was also the York Mercers, and there are accounts of their wa- their pageant wagons and what they look like. And uh, the 1509 and the 1519 uh, accounts called for wagon loads of earth, plausteris terra, and that would have been for the last judgment stage. So the, that quantity of earth suggests the possibility that the floor of the wagon was made to look like a graveyard. So whatever their resources are, that would be like hey, this guild is good at this or does this or has this resource, they are going to perform this part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Truly community theater. Truly, yeah. It was totally like every year the community would know it's coming up and there was a lot of effort put into a lot of these pageant wagons. They weren't just like cheap. Yeah. It was it was a point of pride and like something that just the community did all together. Mm-hmm. A 1433 official inventory for the York Guild of Mercers includes an extensive catalog of materials for their doomsday pageant, and much of the inventory describes the features of the pageant wagon. So here I'm going to get into the pageant wagon for the Last Judgment, the Doomsday. So that would be Mm -hmm. like one of the last parts of this biblical story. Mm -hmm. Much of the inventory describes the features of the pageant wagon. At the ground level was the mouth of hell. The platform of the wagon may have served as earth, and that would have been complete with thrones of judgment for Christ and the apostles. In Chester, there were trap doors that may have allowed reincorporated souls to rise from their graves. So that way there was Uh this travel space between being in hell and being up on earth if you were playing one of the resurrected, like the saved souls. Mm -hmm. 
And then last in the upper level of the wagon, the top part of it was heaven, constructed upon an iron frame with with iron supports. And a locksmith had to be hired at one point in 1451 or 52 to repair heaven, which suggests that this hoisting mechanism was intricate enough to require skills beyond that of the average iron worker. So it was a total uh, work of pride and it would have been so cool to see what those look like. I wish we had remnants of the of the wagons. That's so cool though. <laughs> like yeah. imagine having the skills to build a like three story or three level mm-hmm. movable wagon. Right. Where there's levees where like if you have an actor who's in the pits of hell and they end up being saved, they can just get like pulled on up through a levee system and like pop back onto Earth the middle level and everyone's like that's so cool and it, there's no technical difficulties wild yeah so medieval pageant wagons could if the guild was wealthy and crafty enough could contain uh superstructures which totally blew my mind because i i guess i've never really given much thought to what a pageant wagon actually looked like or what it could do yeah early modern playhouses were anachronistic They mingled out-of-date classical and medieval theater architecture to entertain a modern audience. So think of the globe or think of the Uh source that the new globe was based on. So there's columns, pillars, a quasi-circular amphitheater design. And they also adopted the structural iconography of the mystery plays for the outdoor and indoor playhouses. Wait, so you're saying that when these theaters were originally built... They were already like, here's your old timey theater space. Like they already had ideas for the mechanisms as they were. And they also did take from other like spaces. It was like, Like, here is like all this stuff mashed together from like previous iterations of theater. Yeah. So it it would maybe would be like having a brand new theater complex. Be like, we're only using candlelight in this indoor space. Yeah. That's otherwise state of the art. Right. Exactly. So that's how these early modern playhouses were designed. Yeah. And uh, the playhouses also included the trap door, a stage floor, a star gilt roof. And also they rematerialized the three-tiered cosmography of heaven, earth, and hell of the medieval drama. Think of that pageant wagon with heaven, earth, and hell. So there's three levels in these playhouses as well. Mm Mm-hmm. And my source, Schreier argues that it makes no surprise that early modern playwrights also adopted the medieval drama's morality themes into their plays. They were taking from the structures of these mystery Mm -hmm. plays. Might as well take some of those themes. And early modern plays use the pageantry and stage architecture showcased in the plays of Doom. So Dr. Faustus is dragged down to hell by demons. Hamlet's ghost shouts from the globe's cellarage. And Ben Johnson's envy arises from the center stage trapdoor at the Blackfriars in Poet Taster. Wow. Uh-huh. So if you go on a tour of like the Elizabethan theater at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, for example, or any modern Elizabethan style mm-hmm. theater, they'll point these out as the heavens and hell. The like trapdoor underneath is known as hell, and the balconies up mm-hmm. above are known as the heavens. And they'll kind of explain of like, oh yeah, like this is where you would put like the gods or uh, ghosts or demons might rise from here or come from up there. But mm-hmm. I did not know that it came from medieval pageant wagons. I didn't either. And the fact that the medieval pageant wagons, the medieval like cycle plays are like kind of ignored, I think, in contemporary theater seasons. We don't see a whole lot of medieval cycle plays. I know that York still holds their like mystery plays I every say, year. I like, but... there's modern theater companies of color that have taken the pageant wagon concept and created a new iteration of like itinerant theater. Teatro Campesino mm-hmm. in California is a very famous one that used the model of medieval pageant wagons and itinerant theater during the United Farm Workers Movement do short mm-hmm. plays for farm workers on their rights and what the movement was working towards. Yeah. Right. But uh, I, yeah, I yeah. like you don't <laughs> you don't go and see the play Every Man, which is a 15th century morality play in a modern theater season. Right. And um I guess I'm I'm thinking of like how the Globe Theater will produce 
Shakespeare's plays in original right. practice, like we're only going to use costumes of the time and all that kind of stuff. And I suppose York does do medieval plays like every year and they carry on the tradition. So that might be unfair of me to like expect more of it. But that's that's the pageant wagon and the stages of the time, the playhouses of the time were influenced by like the mechanisms of the Last Judgment mystery play or one could see how they would be. Oh, and one last part of the Doomsday play, the Last Judgment uh, medieval cycle play that um, one could say maybe Shakespeare incorporated is Discretio Spiritum, which is where a person can distinguish between good and evil apparitions. Um, it's a part of the Last Judgment mystery mm. play. And the Hell and Purgatory's Discretio Spiritum action serves as a sorting of good and bad, followed by their eternal consignment. And in the case of Hamlet, if we're looking at it through Purgatory, Purgatory complicates the plot of the Last Judgment, and it delays its resolution. Mm. So Discretio Spiritum likewise forestalls the immediate action of Hamlet's revenge by compelling the protagonist to discover the origins of his father's ghost and determine, are you good or are you bad? Ooh, interesting. Which, like the revenge tragedy, it would need to have a delay because we need five acts. Yeah. We need to sit people down to watch a play. Right. And outside of how the theater was designed and this delay of action, the text of Hamlet does allude to a lot of these doomsday pageants. It alludes to last trumpets, ministers of grace, flights of singing angels, souls damned and black as hell, eternal audits. And all of this is anticipating a last judgment. And like the doomsday plays, where they're trying to sort good and bad and figure out who goes where. The final resolution is continually deferred for Hamlet. So Schreier argues that Shakespeare uses these material remnants uh, and the language of the Last Judgment pageants to create a atmosphere of tragedy that doomsday mm -hmm. is near and also to defer Hamlet's revenge on a practical level. It's interesting to me that, one, we have this like very technical way of like how this could be staged to suggest that they are in different places or that like this ghost is not of this world but then that like the inspiration that that is coming from is also this common person's access into the storytelling tradition that has mm -hmm. influenced theater and it's again not directly christian theology about ghosts it is more like these references to this just like earlier version of theater or these oral traditions um these like other storytelling modalities that have been largely lost to time mm -hmm. that are potentially like bigger influences into specifically the story of hamlet and how it was told for its contemporary audience we also found that in Macbeth, right. that like there were elements in Macbeth that were references back to the common person's knowledge of story. And I'm also thinking too that like the pageant wagons, the mystery plays were all written and performed before the Protestant Reformation and before this Protestant concept of ghosts and demons and devils. And what I hear today is people analyzing the ghosts and the death and the afterlife of Hamlet through that lens. But there's far more references, I think, to these ghost stories or these mm -hmm. Last Judgment doomsday plays. Yeah. And my reading also mentions that the Last Judgment may have been the most popular scene that was depicted in medieval early modern church wall paintings before all mm. the whitewashing. So, like, if we're thinking about mystery plays, the Last Judgment being the common person's experience with the church and with ghost stories, and then The Last Judgment being the most popular. Most people at this time period were not able to read yeah. the Bible. If this is also one of the more popular things that's depicted on church walls, that means it's potentially right near the three living and three dead kings depictions. And so these things are, mm -hmm. you know, potentially very tied together in the common imagination right and it's within maybe a hundred years ago so it's, again maybe like your grandmother would have seen this on a wall right right yeah the depictions of the last judgment would have been heaven with christ apostles angels and saints 
hells, tormenting flames, and then earth where the dead emerge from graves, learn their fate, and encounter either a spirit of health or a goblin damned who carries them to their final destination. There are these ideas of like, this is what happens in heaven, this is what happens in hell, and this is the experience you'll have on earth with spirits, whether good spirits or bad spirits. But purgatory wasn't a part of the conversation in the Last Judgment depictions on these walls. Final thoughts. Hamlet is a ghost story. Hamlet is a ghost story. Hamlet is a ghost story, and it seems to be a uniquely medieval English ghost story. Yeah. I think it's also Bernardo's ghost story. Mm -hmm. So let's give him a moment with all the guys, all the lads sitting around before there's a giant, like, thump or a howl or something, and we see, like, a grotesque old Uh Hamlet. I want to see Hamlet as a ghost story now. I want to see a spooky, spooky, spooky 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 Hamlet. Because everyone thinks of Macbeth as, like, the Halloween play. Yeah. The Halloween play. And it's like, hold on. For now, I think we can leave it at Hamlet as a ghost story. Let's start producing it in October. Love it. And with that, thank you for listening to this episode. Our kind listeners, we can no other answer make but thanks and thanks and ever thanks to our Patreon patrons. Shelby Gage, Alan Carlson, and Elizabeth Sharman. I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. This is Shakespeare Anyone. Thank you so much for listening to Shakespeare Anyone. Works referenced in this episode are available in the episode description. Our theme music is Never Ending Minute by Sounds Like Sander. If you would like to support us, it would help us out if you would hit the subscribe button, like us, leave a comment, write a review, share us on social media, tell a friend about us, all the things. We'd appreciate it. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash Shakespeare Anyone. Patreon patrons get access to exclusive bonus content throughout the year. The link is also in the episode description. For more, you can visit our website, shakespeareanyone.com, follow us on Instagram at shakespeareanyonepod, or Twitter at shakespeareanyone. For Twitter, that's Shakespeare Any and the number one. Every other platform is spelled out like the name of the podcast. Now, because you listened all the way to the end of the credits, here's a completely random Shakespeare quote for you. From Twelfth Night, Act 3, Scene 4, Spoken by Antonio. One, sir, the for his love dares yet do more than you have heard him brag to you he will.